things that we need to do. We need to do those things through love. We're exhorted to do those things through Christ when we come into his kingdom, aren't we? So just moving on, I'm not going to stay a long time in uh, these Old Testament verses, but basically our righteousness comes from Christ. That's the important thing. And self-righteousness uh, is just no good at all. And, and one of the things that gives us an indication of that is that if you have, for example, if you had two men running for a train, and one man um, was a murderer, a thief and a liar, <coughs> And, and the other man was what we would call in this world a good man. This man, oh, he was good to his wife. He, he always worked very hard. Um, he was in retirement age, and so he tended his, his, um, his garden, and he always spoke to the, the children nicely and gave them sweets, and, and uh, you know, was very kind uh, to people generally. And we would see this man as a good man. Certainly outwardly we would see him as a good man. And this man was also running for this train. And they, they both run very fast down the platform and they, they actually managed to get on this train just before it was pulling out. But the fact of the matter is, the fact that one man was a murderer, a thief and a liar, and the other man was a good man, righteous in his own sight, didn't make any difference to the fact that the train was going in the wrong direction. Yeah. And, and that's really what we need to remember, that our righteousness is no good in our own strength and in what we do, in our personal righteousness. We will never get into the kingdom of God in our own strength, in our own life. We can't buy our way in, we cannot get into the kingdom unless we come through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So it's his righteousness, it's his blood that covers us, and it's only because he lived a sinful life that he could do that. Otherwise he'd have been nailed to the tree for his own sins. So he was a lamb without blemish. He was the lamb that was slain for us. His blood covers us. And his blood makes that covenant agreement that lasts eternally for us. Just remembering that is really important to us. And then we come through to Romans, <clears throat> we come through to Romans chapter 13, and uh, <clears throat> what do we see in Romans? Well, Romans starts to talk about, um, about the law, and uh, one of the things that Romans talks us about, to us about, is, is that we should owe no one anything except to love one another. So we should be no man's debtor except to love one another. And, you know, there have been times in my life, certainly, where through business, through uh, situations, through bringing up children, that uh, I have actually managed to get myself into debt, quite a lot of debt at different times. And I have always tried to pay off that debt. And the important thing for me is that my conscience was good, and I tried to do what I could, and the important thing now is for me to accept love from another Christian and also to give love to another Christian and to love the world and not to be um, someone who goes around trying to find um, people that's going to give to me and that's going to uh, lend me money because it's, I only have to pay it back at the end of the day. So I don't live in credit card land anymore. I've, I've changed my tack because I want to live according to faith. I want to live the way God intended me to, to be no man's debtor. And that's not a criticism of anyone. You know, there have been times, as I say, where I have had to borrow money to survive. And sometimes, sometimes we do have situations where we, you know, we get mortgages, for example, and there are times when it's, it is appropriate. But the important thing is that we should be no man's debtor through love. In the same way that we can't we can't outgive God's love, neither should we be any man's debtor in love. We should always be loving one another exceptionally. He says, because Jesus says, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. So that's what's taken place really. So when we, when we talk about 
the law when we started our service. We talk about the fact that um, you, know, you should love the Lord your God with all your soul, with your strength, with all your mind. You know, we know why. We know that you know, the Ten Commandments, the first four, are towards God. They point us to God. We should love God. And the second six of the commandments are about our neighbour, that we should love our neighbour as we love ourselves. And Jesus summed those two commandments up, uh, those commandments up in two. To love God and to love your neighbour as yourself. And so when you come to that point of loving yourself, of finding that love for yourself, something changes in your heart. Because you can't come to that place of really loving yourself, I don't believe, until you really know the love of God. Because you can never love yourself in the right way. If you don't understand what love is, what true love is, how can you ever love in a right way? And this is one of the problems that the world has. It doesn't love in the right way. We see love as, as somebody, well, children are like it today, aren't they? We're only good parents if we never tell our children of it. If we never smack our children. We're only good parents if we give them everything they want. And we have a generation of children growing up like that now. That they, they don't appreciate things. That they don't have a lot of respect. Now, this is a generality. There are exceptions to every rule. And I'm sure that there are people that have got children that, that are very respectful, that do appreciate everything, and are wonderful children. Bless God. That's amazing. But I'm saying as a generality, we, we have a downgrade going on in the world. There is a, a, a dropping off of the wisdom of God because God is not taught in the schools anymore. All faiths are taught in the school. And the God of the Bible is not taught in the same way that it used to be. Prayers are taken out of school. So many things that we don't do. People don't go to church anymore very much. And we have to ask the question, why? Why is it they don't come to church? Mostly because they don't find it any kind of relevance to what their, what their life is. But it's about, it's about loving properly. It's about learning the wisdom of God in love is learning about agape love and not just the world's kind of love, which is usually in terms of doing the politically correct thing, or love is sex, and, and, and these things are not the same. It's not the wisdom of God. But Jesus says, if you want to, uh, to carry out the commandments correctly, then it's about fulfilling the law through love. It's about being in a love walk. Okay? You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there was any other commandment, because I mean the Jews had so many commandments, there was more than one for each day. They had so many laws. But they're all summed up. Jesus says, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. And love does no harm to a neighbour. Therefore love is the fulfilment of the law. And so he's saying to us now in verse 13, let us walk properly. Let us put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if we want to know what love is, we look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he is the absolute example of love. That he loved us so much that, that he stretched out his arms on the cross and he gave up his life for us on the cross. That's the kind of love that God really shows us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we come through to the New Testament and we come through to Matthew and the Gospel again. And read it from Matthew 18, 15 to 20. Jesus himself, his own words, he's saying, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he, if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, 
Tell it to the church. 